Okay, we're live on the Kingdoms podcast. Today, I have with me a very important guest. Uh, he's somebody who I look up to, and he is the president of the Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. Please be welcome, David Feldman. How are you, David? I'm doing well, my man. How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Thank you very much for uh, honoring the invitation to the King Dames podcast. So you are a very busy man. Let's get down to brass tacks real quick. So the very first question I ask people on the podcast is how is childhood, you know, how was childhood and growing up for them, you know, that you understand, you know, the basic uh, and fundamental personality. So for you, what was childhood like and what was growing up for like you? Say that question one more time. I'm sorry. I was like, what was your childhood like? Like, uh, who were your childhood heroes? Who were your childhood influences? Child, so sorry. how how did your childhood um, influence you as a person? Yeah, I had a, um, honestly, I, my childhood is the reason why I succeed right now, because I actually had a very bad childhood. And things didn't go the way they were supposed to go for me. And, um, you know, I dealt with a lot of stuff through my childhood years. And uh, it took me a, a long time to figure out um how to overcome the the setbacks and the obstacles that i had as a child um and some of the some of the things that happened in my childhood and to turn them around and use them as a driving force and that's why really why you know i'll never quit and i'll never stop is because i was told i was supposed to stop i was told i was never going to be anything i was told i was you know i shouldn't be anything in life and as you know, I went through a lot of stuff as a child and as I got into adulthood, it carried over with me. And then when I was able to turn that all around and use it as a driving force, my whole life changed. And, you know, I just see things through a more positive light and understand that, you know, bad things that happen to you can turn into really good and can turn into really good and make you want to do really good for other people as well, you know, because you don't want other people to go through some of the things that you went through. And that's why, really, just why I'll never quit. Like, that's why I'll probably be very successful in this, just because I won't quit. And I'm going to find a way to make this the best thing in the world. And, you know, it's on its way to get there. It's got a long way to go, but we're not going to stop until we get there. Wow, fantastic. You know, I, like I was telling you before we hit the record button, right? I look up to you a lot and things that resonate with you, uh, that, that, that also resonate with me, is that positive energy. I, I, I see the positive energy in you. I see the spirit of determination, resilience, right? That never give up spirit. And it is very, very fantastic. And, you know, you also give hope. You inspire other people uh, to, to do better in life. And it's great to, to speak with you today. So can, can you actually take us back to your early days, you know, your early career and like what inspired you to become heavily involved in combat sports? Um, I... Actually, I was born into it. My father was a professional boxer and then turned into training seven world champions. Um, my mother got seriously injured. Um, uh, ha has a, a, a lot of bad stuff happened to her. Uh, she ended up in a wheelchair and was a quadriplegic, paralyzed from her neck down. And my dad then turned our house kind of into a training camp where a lot of the fighters just came in the house and, and lived with us all through my childhood years. So I've been around combat sports my whole life. I turned into a professional boxer. And then I uh, started promoting fights in my uh, late 20s. I kind of didn't really like it, to be honest with you. I, I didn't like the people in the business. It was the wrong kind of people there. And I'm going to get to that later as I explain why I, why I started Bare Knuckle. But, you know, I just, I, uh, I then started promoting um, boxing matches with my brother. We partnered on some stuff. And then I uh, started in the mixed martial arts and did some more boxing. And then I just wanted to do something different. And that's where I get into this is I wanted to create a sport that wasn't infected at all, right? It didn't have the bad people in it that are in these other sports that are in it for the wrong reasons, that are in it just for money, just to see what they can take off the athletes. You know, um, obviously want to make money with this business. I, I certainly do. I want to spread it around though. And I want everybody to be treated fair. And I'm not saying I want to change the whole world in combat sports, meaning I can't change everything about how, you know, 
fighters are paid and fighters are treated. But I just feel like you should make them a part of the team and treat them right. And that's kind of why we started our own thing. And and the vision that we had was to create something very, very exciting, very fast paced for today's society. As we know, today's society, they're always looking for, you know, to look at something for two minutes and then look at something else and then look at something else. <laughs> they're like viral movements. <laughs> that's it. And we gave them those. What we say is the oh shit moment. We gave them the oh shit moment and we gave them really fast paced stuff. And, you know, we treat the fighters good, man. We make them a part of the company. We make them earn money with sponsorships, with uh, selling the uh, the pay-per-views, with selling tickets, with a lot of different avenues. And, you know, we just try to, we, we try to treat everybody right. And, you know, I live by do the right thing, right? Like, I'm not saying you know, give all your stuff away and do that. But if you're questioning, should I do it this way or do it that way? Then I just say, do the right thing, right? I say it to my people all the time. What do you think is right? And they go, well, this way. But then it's going to cost us this. I said, but which way is right? And then I'll tell them and they'll say this way. And I'll say, do it that way then. Because it'll always work out for you in the end. It might not work out for you that minute. But in the end, it'll always work work out for you if you do the right thing. Oh, wow, interesting. Uh, quick word: Have you actually taken the sixteen personality test? No. Okay, I think you should take that test, right? Because when I took the test uh, recently, and uh, one of the characteristics uh, that they said my personality has is you are always willing to stand up for the right thing, even when it is difficult, even when it is challenging. And I see that actually resonates with you as well, right? It's, a, a lot of times, standing up for the right thing is not the popular opinion. But when you sign up for the right thing, in the end, you discover that it actually pays off in the long run, right? Yeah. No, I, do, I never watched that? that. That was something that, that my dad always said. You you know, when we're just growing up, he's like, do the right thing. You know, I would ask him, should I do this or should I do that? Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. It's not easy. It's not easy all the time. It's, it's not, not the fastest easy. way. It's not the shortest way. But at the end of the road. And that's really where success comes in, right? You have to have a vision to see to the end of the road. Because as you're driving down that long road and it's dark and it's rainy and you can't see where you're going and you're going to get tired and you're going to say, man, should I keep driving? I don't see the end of the road. Or should I stop and turn around and quit and turn around? And it's you have to have the patience to get to the end of the road. And if you have the patience to get to the end of the road, you succeed. And if you succeed, it's because you did the right thing. You did what you were supposed to do. And you put the time and the work in and you have to be able to see to the end of the road. You really do, because if you don't see to the end of the road, you don't have to get all the way to the end of the road always. But if you can't see to the end of the road, you won't be successful. Hmm, interesting. So w one thing I really admire about you and your organization is uh, the fact that you place a lot of priority on taking care of the fighters. Right. Because this guy is a beef for you. Uh, people like Mike Perry, people like uh, Lorenzo Hans, right? They always speak the good word about BKFC, saying how you have changed their lives, how you you have put their money up, right? You have actually changed their money game, right? How how does it feel for you knowing that you actually change um, people's lives and they're always speaking good about you? Like how how does it feel for you? I mean. It's awesome, but it's again, it's do the right thing. Now, listen, I'm not a sucker either. I'm not just paying everybody good money that's not helping me. The guys that want to push this sport and talk about it and help it and blow it up, those are the guys that are going to make the money here. The guys that are drawing in the views, that are getting people to watch this thing, that get people to buy tickets, those are the people that we're going to do the right thing for. I'm not just like an open wallet and say, hey, here, take this. <laughs> doing the right thing for Again, it goes back to do the right thing. If they're doing the right thing, then we're going to do the right thing. So do the right thing, promote it right, talk good about us, do everything the right way, and then you're going to get taken care of. And yeah, look, it feels great when people say, man, I was going to do this and, you know, I was depressed or I contemplated, you know, not even going on in life because life was going so bad for me. And I met you and I fought for you and you changed my life. I mean, it's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, one thing I admire uh, as well about you, you and your organization is the fact you get to focus on your organization, unlike, you know, other presidents, other 
you know, executives of other, of other fighting championships, they like to compare themselves with other people, right? We see other promotions, for example, I am a strong, a diehard MMA fan, for example. I see how the other guys try to compare themselves with the UFC, right? You are not the UFC, you are you. So focus on you, right? Uh, I see you are like the forefront of Benoko fighting right now and other guys are trying to compare themselves with you. How do you feel <laughs> when these guys you know, try to talk down at you just to make themselves feel good? <laughs> how, how does that feel? <laughs> it, you, you know, it's we just focus on ourselves. I, you know, I had a meeting with Dana White a couple weeks ago, and I saw, one, I saw that. I saw your picture with Dana. How did he go? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not going to talk about a lot of things we talked about, but it was. Okay. I found out a lot about him. Great guy, smart. Mm-hmm like knows what he's doing. He, he blew this thing up. He's got a lot of great ideas and he, and he's actually a real good guy, man. He's a good guy. Mm-hmm. But, but what we talked about is I said, you know, we talked about some of my numbers and where I was going. And I said, he, he was like, wow, that's pretty good. I said, I just focus on myself. I don't compare myself to you. I said, a lot of people say I'm the next Dana White. I'm the next this, I'm the next that. And I go, man, that's a compliment, right? As far as growing in a uh, combat sports business, they're, comparing me to the best you know that's an amazing thing when what you said is these other guys that want to talk bad about me and things like that you know that's okay it, let them talk bad it's um it's all part of the game you know focus on yourself focus on your goal stay in your lane right and that's what we do we, we focus on our only competition we we feel is is, is ourselves are we going to put a better show on than we did last time are we going to treat the guys better than we did last time are we going to get better fighters in the organization than we did the fight before and as long as we keep doing that we're going to keep growing and we're and you know i don't see an end in an end in 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 the near future for us at all hmm. interesting so um ben Hockel is actually quite unique you know and it's relatively like a new audition in terms of promotion because apparently it has a, a long history right but then in terms of you know packaging something into a proper promotion and you know serving it to to the combat sport audience right so what really inspired you to start you know that promotion which is focused on just bed knuckle fighting what was the inspiration really i i just wanted to do something different i wanted to create something different i knew that promoting mixed martial arts and promoting boxing i would be a me too i would be another organization that was doing what everybody else did and to succeed in something like that you need millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars to do that and i didn't have that so I said, let's create something new, create something different, create something that is, this is the key word, is relatable, it's relatable to everybody in the world. Because look, you're an MMA fan. If you weren't, and I went up to you and I said, do you know what a Uma Palata is? You'd probably go, no. Do you know what a dark joke is? You know what a dark joke. joke is? Right? Most people don't. But every, Yeah, most people do man, not know those technical every, terms. Man, woman, child, adult. Black, white, Chinese, doesn't matter how old you are. If I ask you, do you know what a bare knuckle punch is? Every single person in the world knows what it is. That's why it's so <laughs> relatable. So I wanted to create something relatable that the people could understand and it was easy for them to know. And now, you know, we're just putting on, I think, some of the best fights out there. And, you know, we created our own lane. We just created our own sport, our own lane. And that's why we really don't have a lot of competition. The only thing we really compete with some other organizations over is fighters, but we're not really competing with them on views and things like that because we're different. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Interesting. So um, anyways, in in business school, there there was some strategy that uh, I learned. It's called the Blue Ocean strategy, right? That is contesting in uncontested market spaces. And that is exactly what you have done. You created a blue ocean strategy for yourself. And of course, it's really working out uh, well. Fantastic one. You guys started in 2018, right? That is in June 2018. And now you have like 57 numbered events, right? Well, our our journey actually started in 2009 is when I tried to get illegal. So I started trying to get oh, illegal. Wow. It took me, you know, almost 10 years to get illegal. And then, then when I first, when I, when I finally got illegal, we did three fights the first year, five fights the second year, 12 fights the third year, the third year, 29 fights last year. And we're projected to do 42 fights in 2024. Oh, wow. So, so what were the biggest challenges you faced, you know, when establishing BKFC, both in terms of the regulatory huddles, getting acceptance from fans and fighters? 
I think I think the biggest hurdle that I that I faced was, was really just perception, right? When you mention bare knuckle fighting, people go, "Oh, wow, brutal!" You know, what is it? A backyard street fight? Is it is it in a bar fight? No, it's a very well produced, well organized event that has some of the best combat sports athletes in the world in it. But if they don't watch it, they don't know, and they perceive it to be something else. So perception, me change of perception is probably the biggest thing and the biggest hurdle and the biggest obstacle that I have to go through. Even through today, it is. I have to change everybody's perception. But we've done a great job on changing the fans' perception and really changing the regulatory perception on this because now that they allow themselves to watch it and actually learn about it and educate themselves on it, they understand what it is. They understand that the injuries aren't as much as they think they are. They're not even as much as other combat sports. And it's exciting. And it's really, really fun to watch. And once they allow themselves to educate themselves on that, it's it's really game over for us. Yeah, interesting. So BKFC has actually gained significant attention, right, due to that perception change. And of course, it has a fast paced and intense style, right, of fighting. So how do you see the sport evolving in the coming years? And what role do you envision your organization playing in the broader landscape of combat sports? Um. I always say, you know, I think a lot of these interviews I've been doing, I think three to five years were definitely the number two combat sports promotion in the world. You know, we could be the biggest because it's so relatable, but, you know, it'll be hard to do anything bigger than what the UFC is doing. They've created themselves into a, into a complete juggernaut and they're doing a hell of a job. But, you know, people compare us, like I said, to the UFC, if we can be half of what the UFC is or 25% of what the UFC is, you know, we hit a grand slam. And I think that's where we end up in the next three years. Oh, wow. Interesting. Uh, speaking of the UFC, I'm actually a very, very big fan of the UFC, right? And um, he, I have seen a lot of crossovers from the UFC into BKFC. So is it, and I saw you with Dana White, right? So is it possible we have some sort of partnership with uh, the UFC at any point uh, in the in the near future? I, I, re I really don't know. I mean, you know, I don't know if that's something that, that they would do. I would do it. I, absolutely. I would. I. That's why I'm meeting with all these different um, owners of these bigger organizations, like like the owner from Ryzen, Saki Gabor. I met with him as well. Um, you know, I want to see what we can do. I want to see how we can, um, how we can, you know, kind of not everybody work together. But, but look, you just saw, I don't know if you just saw the big app that's coming out now with all the big networks are, coming together to create the biggest sports app in the world. ESPN, Fox, Turner, they're all coming together and they're creating the biggest sports app in the world. So why can't some of the big combat sports promotions in the world come together and put on some of the biggest fights in the world? Oh, wow, interesting. Sp speaking of apps, you know, the UFC have uh, the UFC Fight Pass. Uh, is there like any plan for you to also um, broadcast your your content on, on UFC Fight Pass? No, we have our own app, the BKFC. We're looking at doing some other things with some other uh, major platforms. So no, we're not, we're not going to do anything with them right now. But um, uh, you know, you never know what happens. Uh, yeah, the, the yeah the features were the taking, right? So uh, you guys have gained a lot of attention and popularity in a relatively short time. So what do you think sets bare knuckle fighting apart from other combat sports, and how do you see its place in the future of um, combat right. sports generally? I think it's just, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's the most exciting combat sport out there. You know, you can't turn away from it. You can't blink your eye. It's fast paced. Anything can happen at any time there. And um, I think it, it really ad adapts and relates to every fan in the world, really. And I think that um, we're at a great place right now. I mean, we've grown faster than any other combat sports organization has ever grown in, in five and a half years. So, we're in a great spot to really, really expand this thing and, 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 and keep moving. And we're excited to do that. Wow. Past the brewery, you guys are really, really fast growing. You know, it, it, it business school once again, like, oh, I, I don't know if you saw my profile, right? I am a finance guy, right? I'm a chartered accountant, you know, got an MBA, right? So I'm just like a very, very big fan of Compass Sports. But then I like to bring in the business side. I like to bring in the finance, the numbers, right? In order to analyze, you know, Compass Sports as well, right? So you guys have actually like gone through like a lot of challenges, 
right? And seeing the numbers grow. I can, in, in terms of uh, the business model, you guys are like a star product, right? So sometimes we have, you know, what you have the cash cows, you have the stars, you have the problem child, but then you guys are the stars with the kind of meteoric growth that you guys have had, you know, in a very, very short period of time. Now, as a president, you have actually encountered like various challenges and successes, right? But then can you actually share a memorable moment or a turning point that significantly impacted the trajectory of BKFC right now? Yeah, I think there was a few of them, but I think the most important moment and most memorable moment was when we did our uh, fight in Denver, Colorado on April 29th of last year. And um, we had two former world two former UFC world champions fighting in the main event and co-main event, um, sold out crowd, our biggest crowd to date. And we had a special surprise appearance by Conor McGregor came in, got in our ring and challenged Mike Perry. I think that that really sent viral moments out to the combat sports community. Yeah. And, and I think um, somebody gave him his belt as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lorenzo Hunt. He actually, Lorenzo, Lorenzo, Hunt. Lorenzo gave it to him. He went in the ring and, I think that was a huge turning point for us. I think that was a, a moment where everybody was like, man, this is real. Look, like, because we also had five or six other UFC world champions and six boxing world champions in attendance that night. So, you know, when the best fighters in the world are watching our organization, that means a lot to us. You know, they, they could watch anything in the world, but they're choosing to watch this. And I think that shows the fans really what they should be watching as well. Wow, fantastic. That that really was a great moment, right? But uh, let me put you on the spot. I know you are the president, right? And I know you love all of your fighters. But then if you were to have a Mount Rushmore for BKFC fighters, who are those four guys that will be, that their heads would be there? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I don't want to avoid the answer, but somebody asked me that like three years ago when I did it, and I had like 10 fighters hate me. So I'm not... Oh, wow. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. I mean, look, honestly, <laughs> I, if you told me the top 10, I could probably do that, but I can't narrow it down to four. Okay, you, let's, you know, do top 10. let's do top 10. Let's do top 10. Well, there's, guys, <laughs> top look, 10. There's, guys, there's guys that are some of the best fighters that I have. There's guys that are needle movers as far as popularity. I mean, you obviously got Mike, um, Mike Perry, you got Eddie Alvarez on there, you got Lorenzo Hunt, you got Dave Mundell, you've got Reggie Barnett, who I uh, just got beat. You got Christine Ferreira. You got Britt Hart. You got all these people that have been with us for a long time and are creating a lot of uh, legacy, really, with us. And, um, you know, you, you had Joey Beltran. You had guys on there that have been with us for a long time. So I don't really just want to name who's who. But I'll tell you, man, we've got a lot of great fighters and a lot of people that really help mold this thing into what it is today. Um, you know, that's going to be my answer yeah. for that. <laughs> I like the fact that you have the juggernauts there. Right, because I think to be honest, he got me onto BKFC, uh, Lorenzo Hart. Like that guy does a really, really great job with the hype. He's got a really, really uh, incredible personality, basically. Yeah, like, that guy is incredible. Yeah, he, he, so, he, he, he yep, he's a company uh, guy. We're gonna announce his next fight on Monday. Oh, wow. Interesting. On Monday. Interesting. I I'd like to have him on the podcast as well. Like, that guy is fantastic. That guy does a really, really great job for you guys. Uh, yeah. So, as a leader, right? So, what what values or principles do you prioritize, you know, in your promotion? And how do you aim to differentiate um, BKFC from the other combat sports organizations? You know, it's really, like I said, do the right thing, but it, it's do what you say and say what you do. All right? Hmm. If I tell these guys I'm going to do something for them, I got to do it. And if they tell me they're going to do something for me, they got to do it. All right. And if I do something, it has to be what I said I was going to do. I can't do something different from what I said. I just, just, just be who you, be who you are and be how you treat the people, how you want to be treated. I mean, it, it's just life in general, but that's what happens. And if I treat these guys right and I show them that they're a part of the team, and I show them they're a part of the family and I show them that are part of the growth. And I give them a chance to earn extra money at the fights. You know, with my pre-fight speeches, I always offer bonuses to guys to go out there and fight their hardest. I just, just, you know, motivate these guys. Um, you know, a big thing with me is loyalty. But there's, you know, in the fight game, there's not a ton of loyalty. But I ask these yeah. guys to be loyal because if they're loyal to me, I'm loyal back to them. And, 
you know, just really, truly just treat people you want to be treated, man. That's really what you got to do. Oh, interesting. You know, um, Pinocchio, it actually has a long history in terms of um, the history of combat sports, but a lot of people do not realize that Pinocchio has a long history. I remember sometime, um, I think Tyson Fury was saying he's from like a lineage of fighters. I think one of, like, one of like his grandparents was uh, a Pinocchio fighter, right? And yep. it's interesting to see what you have actually made of the sport in the modern era. Right. But then what actually made you believe that there was actually a market and an audience for, you know, bed knuckle in today's, you know, combat sports landscape where you're competing with, you know, MMA, with boxing, with, you know, other uh, disciplines? Like what actually made you have that belief it was actually going to become commercial? Because I did it. I did an underground fight back in 2008 and I watched these two guys banging it out with each other. And I left there and I said, there's no way that, that people don't want to see this. It was unbelievable. Mm. It was the best I've ever seen. Listen, you go to a you go to a, a, a baseball event, you go to a basketball event, you go to a football event, and the fight breaks out in the crowd. Where's everybody look? They look at the fight. If you go to a heavyweight championship boxing match and a fight breaks out in the crowd, you look at the you look at the fight. Mm. They're fighting with burn up, mm. but you go look at that. It's just so relatable. Everybody gets it. Everybody understands it. And once I really was like, wow, man, everybody gets it. They get this. They understand what it is. There's not going to be any way that this thing isn't isn't as popular. The only thing I have, you know, my challenge is doing is getting them to watch the first time. And once they watch the first time, it's over. I mean, (laughs) it's unbelievable. Like, there's nothing else like it. So if you watch it once, you become a, a fan for life. Wow, interesting. So we, we have people transitioning from traditional boxing, from MMA to bare knuckle fighting. So um, what kind of adjustments do you think these fighters actually need to make in order to be successful in the sport? I mean, they got to really learn how to pick their shots properly and place them properly. You know, they say boxing is the sweet science. I say this is the sweetest science because you have to really make sure you're not hitting people on top of the head make sure you're not hitting their elbows, make sure you're not hitting hard surfaces. So they have to really pick their shots and they have to condition their hands, right? Um, what a lot of people don't know is we actually have less broken hands than boxing or MMA. And you would never believe that. You would think bare knuckle, they're going to break their hands left and right. But they really wow. pick their shots. They really take their time and know where they're throwing. They don't throw as hard as they would throw with a glove on in fear of breaking their hand. And because of that, they don't break their hand as much and we don't cause as much damage. Mm, interesting. So uh, picking shots is very, very essential. But then, you know, it's it's interesting to see how people do not cost to victory in Ben knuckle, right? They in can't. MMA, for example, <laughs> you, you see some people cost to victory. They can't because I tell them beforehand, I said, listen, guys, I said, if you go out there, this is exactly what I say verbatim. I say, guys, I want you to be safe. I want you to respect my employees. I want you to respect the commission. I want you to respect your opponent and I want you to respect the fans and I want you to go out there and fight your ass off and I tell this to him I said if you fight your ass off and you get knocked out you come back if you coast to a victory and you win you don't come back we need exciting fights we need to go out there and fight and if you go out there and fight you have a job with me forever if you go out there and coast you don't have a job at all (laughs) interesting Well, that's listen, how I, I, see we, we don't... I give him a chance. Oh, wow. hey, listen, if you go out there, look, most organizations <laughs> a fight. I give like 10 or 12 performance bonuses every fight. Well, that, that is massive. That is massive, really. That's, and it's a, it's a lot of incentive. The biggest incentive, basically, to me, I don't know maybe because I'm biased, I'm a finance guy, is the financial incentive. So what other incentive is, is bigger, right? And, you know, when, when, when the fighters are incentivized, apparently, you know, they, they, they stay hungry and they always want more. Yep, <laughs> right. Sure. So, so we've seen like a lot of crossovers, right? Like uh, from MMA, boxing, like what do you see? What do you see going forward? Do you see, the, do you see more crossovers happening? Or do I, you see I do, but... I do, but what I really see is people starting out the sport with bare knuckle now, not just crossing over, but do we have a lot of gyms now teaching bare knuckle fighting. So go into the gyms, learn in bare knuckle fighting, 
training for bare knuckle fighting and starting and finishing your career as a bare knuckle fighter, not necessarily crossing over from boxing or MMA. I don't think that's going to stop. I still think a lot of boxing and MMA fighters are going to cross over. But I think what you're going to see here in the next couple of years is a lot of guys actually starting their careers just with bare knuckle. Wow. Interesting. So uh, you, you actually mentioned uh, safety earlier. So how, how do you guys prioritize our safety in, for, for the fighters? And it, it's not that I got, you know, we have three or four uh, ringside positions at every event. Our chief medical officer, we're one of only two promotions in the world that travel a chief medical officer with us. So we travel a physician with us to every fight. That's our own that we have on a payroll. Dr. Don Muzi, um, unbelievable physician. You know, he was the president of the Association of Ringside Physicians for years. He's a great guy and understands this. And he knows that safety is paramount, right? You might have a little nick on the corner of a guy's eye and he'll go, it's not bleeding. Why are you stopping the fight? Because my doctor knows that if it cuts a little more, it might impair your eyelid from ever opening and closing again. So we're going to stop the fight. He's, he's, safety is number one for us. Pre-fight medicals making sure they're fit to fight and checking them out after they fight are, are really our number one priorities for BKFC. Wow. That, that, I think that that's a really great one. Uh, you guys have actually featured fighters from like various backgrounds, different experience levels. Then can you discuss the scouting and the recruitment process for the fighters and what qualities do you actually look out for for potential BKFC athletes? At one point, why what? Like, you guys have fighters from various backgrounds and different experience levels, right? But then what kind of qualities do you look out for in terms of scouting and recruitment? I mean, I got to make sure that they have experience in there. I, I want to make sure that, you know, I don't have a lot of guys that got knocked out a lot. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for guys that don't have to be the best slick boxer in the world, right? They don't have to be the best MMA fighter in the world. They got to be able to throw punches really nice professionally they got to be able to take a good punch and they got to have the heart to keep going and that's really what i'm looking for i'm looking for guys i'm not looking for the best technicians in the world i'm looking for the best fighters in the world the guys that want to go out there and just fight and that's really what i'm looking for because that's what the fans want to see and i think in some boxing and some mma matches recently they're getting cheated out of good fights i just want good fights and i think the fans want to see good fights i think they love it in boxing, they love it when two boxers are in the middle of the ring exchanging punches. In MMA, they love it when two guys are in the center of the, center of the ring banging it out with each other. And that's what we do the whole entire fight. Right. Interesting. So what, what advice do you have for young aspiring fighters that uh, intend to uh, take up BKFC? I mean, look, just don't quit. Walk forward. You know, have the guts to, if you want to compete, have the guts to walk to the guy, exchange punches, and don't quit. Now I'm saying you might get knocked out. That's okay. You you might lose. That's okay. If you come and fight hard, you know, you're in the right place. If if you're not looking to come and fight hard and entertain the crowd, then this is probably not the promotion for you. <laughs> Interesting. So um, you know, you know the success of us sports promotion is not just about you know putting up the fights right you also have the marketing sponsorship building the fan base the business side basically so how, how do you take care of the business side as well it, it you you build a good team you know you you start with a foundation and we started with four guys for three years we became very very well known with only four full-time employees and then we opened up to a lot more employees obviously it's just, um, you know, surround. I always say, man, and people say this in sayings, but it's true for me. I never want to be the smartest guy in the room. I want to, I want a bunch of smart guys around me because then I know I'm going to grow my company the right way. And that's what I always do. I always have a, a room full of smart guys with me and people that know a lot more about me in, in their respective trades. And that's why I know yeah. we're going to blow. Oh, wow. Interesting. Interesting. I, I like, I like somebody who, uh, builds a great team, you know, has a team of professionals because I'm a professional, right? And then, you know, I appreciate the role of professionals and kudos to you, big ups to you. Uh, hopefully, I should have some partnership with you in the future. I, <laughs> we don't know what the future holds, but then uh, I, 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 I would love, I would love for that. You know, that's a really, really positive one. 
Um, so basically, uh, can you share some, you know, memorable uh, cards, right? W which ones have been your most memorable fights, your most memorable events uh, so far in the sport? Um, you know, I, I think Christine Furia fighting Helen Peralta was one of the best women's fights I've ever seen. And I think that made people open up a lot of eyes. Um, Jason Knight, when he fought Artem Lobov, I think a lot of people started really watching then. We had former world boxing champion Paul Mal Paulie Malinaji fight. I think that really got the boxers really talking about us. And then when we signed Paige Van Sant and she started fighting for us, we got a lot of the MMA people really watching us. And then Mike yeah. Perry, comes yeah. on board. you know, Mike, Mike Perry coming on board, Eddie Alvarez, Luke Rockhold, those kind of guys. They really made a lot of guys really tune in for us. And um, you know, probably the cards that they were on were probably some of the most memorable cards. There's really been a lot of great cards, a lot of great fights. I, I mean, you know, I remember one of the best fights that I've ever saw in the organization was Rhino Riley for Truckton Carson in uh, South Carolina. It was one of the best fights that we've ever had in, in history so far. It was just bell to bell um, fighting with. Actually, that was in Tampa, Florida, I think. But um, it was an unbelievable fight. So many of them, so many of them. But I think the ones that I mentioned are the ones that really got a lot of people interested in the sport. <laughs> Yes, that, that's actually very true. Paige Van Zandt, for example, from the UFC, I remember vividly, like, she actually drew um, our attention from the MMA world. So, looking, you've actually had a, a global impact in terms of, you know, the combat sport scene, right? So, are there, in terms of numbers, right, what do you see? What are the aspirations going forward? As for, as, as, say the beginning of that question again, uh, I didn't hear uh, uh, I said you have actually impacted the global scene, the global combat, the combat sport scene, right? So, what are the aspirations? What are like the goals, the targets for, let's say, the next five years? I mean, really, like, I mean, I want to do as big as I can do. I want to be the biggest thing we can be. But I'm in this for one reason, really, man. I want to. These people that dedicate their lives to me, these people that go out there and bleed for me and risk their life for me, man. I want to change all their lives. That's what I'm in it. I want to change their lives. And when I can change people's lives and for the better, and I noted that that they gave up, you know, a lot of their life for me to help grow the business and help grow my dream and I can hand it back to them, then I know I made it. It doesn't that doesn't mean, you know, being number one, two, three, or four, that you know, it's just when it comes to a certain point, I'll know when that point is. So I'll know when these guys get taken care of. And when they get, get get taken care of, then we can really have a lot of fun with this thing. But um, until everybody really gets what they're supposed to get, and they're go it's going to be soon, then we can, like I said, we can have fun with it. And when we have fun with it, I think that's when it really grows. Like, it's fun. Don't get me wrong. But what, once I take care of the most important parts, and that's taking care of the people that have been there for me. And once I can do that, like, really take care of them, change their lives. Once I can do that, and then we can really have fun. Who knows where this thing goes? It could be the biggest thing in the world. Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, so on a personal note, like what keeps you motivated and what legacy do you want to have? In I just the want world people, of I just want people that have faced adversities in life and, you know, didn't think that they had what it took to accomplish anything in life. I want to be the example to them that if you try hard and you push hard enough, and you have a vision and you have the will and you won't let anyone tear your dream down that you can really do anything in the world that you want to do. And, you know, that's really what I want to do as in my role and being able to inspire other people. I think that, you know, I'm doing a lot to change my life personally. Like, you know, I'm not the best person in the world and I want to be, and I try every day to be a better person. And if I can help other people be better people, and if I can give other people that vision and if I can give other people, you know, a chance to dream, to, to do something that I accomplished, you know, I think that's all that really matters in life. Interesting. So at the end of the podcast, right, we have a tradition where you answer a question from a previous guest and you leave a question for the next guest. So uh, a question from uh, a previous guest is this. If you had the power uh, to help people to change uh, the perspective in terms of the poverty of the mind, you know, they say poverty is not just physical, it's, it's a thing of the mind, right? So what would you do to help people to combat 
to tackle poverty of the mind. Poverty of the mind? And yes, poverty of the mind that has been poor in your mind because a lot of people are actually poor physically because they are poor from their minds. So what would you do to help people in terms of, you know, their mindsets? Just listen, people can tell you no. Everybody can tell you that you can't be this and that you should be, you know, impoverished in your mind and you shouldn't have the better things in life and you can't do it and you have no business being here. But it's just having the fortitude to push forward. And I think that if you just push forward, you change that and you don't have to have the poverty in your mind. You can have the riches in your mind. And the riches in your mind come from inside. They don't come from anything else. They come from you. And when you can teach yourself to just keep moving forward and keep being the best that you can be, being the best that you can be doesn't mean that you have a million dollars or $10 million or a hundred million dollars. You might have $10, you might have no money, but being the best you can and to help motivate other people. I think when I started realizing, you know, I had a lot of issues in my life and when I started realizing that I wanted to help other people and help other people accomplish their goals, that's when I started realizing that I was accomplishing my goals. So I think just mm-hmm. having the fortitude and the no quit in you to just keep moving forward, I think, you know, that takes all the bad stuff away from you. Mm, interesting. So, so what question would you like to leave for the next guest? Um. If you could change anything in the world, one thing in the world to make the world a better place, what would it be? If you could change one thing in the world to make the world a better place, what thing would that thing be, right? Okay, the next guest have that yep. there. The work cut out for them. So who would you like to give a shout out to before you leave today? I mean, I got I just give a shout out to my team. I got the best team in the world, the most loyal team in the world. Um, you know, my family, my wife, Christina, for making all the sacrifices that she makes to make me travel all over the world and come home. And I have a, I have a wife that takes care of me. It's, it's amazing to be in that position. I thank her and I thank my family. I thank the fans. I thank the fighters. I mean, there's so many people to thank, man. The fighters that bleed for me, they bleed for the fans. The fans that day after day, fight after fight, come in and support us and tell other people to watch us, you know, and the team that works way, way harder than they're supposed to work right now. You know, thank everybody. Uh, speaking of thank yous, thank you very much, David Feldman. Uh, God bless you. It's been a really, really great one speaking with you today. And I hope that your story inspires a, a lot of people. I hope your story inspires people not to give up and to uh, make something better of their lives. So awesome. thank you very awesome. much one more You're time. Welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.